I'm going to be reading again today out of Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, and this is out of the, the Living Bible. And I'll be reading verse 26 here says, And I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new and right desires and put a new spirit within you. And I will take out your stony hearts of sin and give you new hearts of love. Aren't you grateful for that? Father, thank you today for your, your wonderful, precious scripture, God. Father, I ask that you feed our hearts from heaven today. Father, let manna from heaven fall in our spirits today. Father, make our hearts tender. Open our eyes and our ears. Let us see. Let us hear from heaven today. In the name of Jesus, speak to the hearts of men and women in this house. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated today. Um, I want to recap just a little bit this morning, and those of you that uh, maybe haven't been here, maybe you're watching online for the first time, or you missed uh, the last service, we've been, uh, we've been doing a series called All, and we've been focusing on the area of Mark chapter 12, that Jesus is having this conversation with, uh, with the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and so forth, and, and he's talking to them, and, and they're trying to trip him up with all kinds of questions, right? And finally, he's answered well over and over again, and a lawyer stands up and says, hey, what is the most important commandment of all? And Jesus answers back and says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. In other words, there's, there's just one God. And he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second is like unto the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. And we, we read a scripture last week that I feel like is so valuable. I want to I wanna just throw this in. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 17 in the Living Bible, verse 9 uh, and 10 says this, The heart is the most deceitful thing there is. <laughs> Don't you just feel great about that? Doesn't that just give you tingly chill bumps all over, right? You know, uh, the heart is the most deceitful thing there is. And desperately wicked, no one can really know how bad it is. Only the Lord knows. He searches all hearts and examines the deepest motives so he can give to each person his right reward according to his deeds, how he has lived. Last week, uh, we spent a, a little while walking through the scriptures and going on a journey, going on the journey with the children of Israel. We know that they had been in bondage 400 years in Egypt. And then we, we see how God miraculously delivers them. And uh, we, we see the 10 plagues uh, that, that God uh, put on Pharaoh and on the, the Egyptians and how that uh, he finally decides to let them go and then the, uh, he moves on the, the Egyptians' hearts and causes them to uh, laden down the children of Israel with all kinds of goods and they come out victoriously and then we see them at the Red Sea and uh, here the Egyptians are like, what do we do? We let them go and so they, they came chasing them and, and the Lord divides the Red Sea and the children of Israel walk across on dry ground and they turn around and they watch the, the most mighty army on planet earth known to man come across this riverbed with water standing on both sides and God released the water and drowned the Egyptians, wiped out 
most mighty army on the face of the planet. We see the children of Israel, uh, they were hungry, and God fed them as men arranged from heaven, right? Uh, they were thirsty, and God caused water to run out of the most unlikely place, a rock, right? And then we see how God led them in the desert with a cloud by day and a fire by night. They watched as the, the glory of God sat down on Mount Sinai. They heard the thunder, thunderings and lightnings, the smoke and the roaring of the voice of God. And they experienced all of these things within the first three months of coming out of Egypt. And yet, Moses goes up the mountain, disappears into the cloud, and they say, where is this Moses? He's taken too long to get back down. Hey, Aaron, up, make us, a, make us gods that will lead us through this desert. And so we, we saw the parallel there that Jesus has ascended out of our sight, a, a cloud he was received up into heaven. And many of us, uh, uh, many of the church world, many of the Christians, uh, you know, where is this return of Jesus, right? He's, uh, we, we don't see him anymore. He's disappeared out of our sight. He's taking too long to come back. We don't know what's happened to this Jesus person. And so little by little, we see they, they begin to grumble and mumble and and they said, make us a God. And they, they bring all of their gold. They throw it into the fire. No, they really didn't. They, they melted it down. And then uh, Aaron fashioned a calf. And the scripture says that they sat down to eat. As a matter of fact, Aaron said, hey, in the morning, we're going to sacrifice a sacrifice, a peace offering unto the Lord. And so they, they fashioned a calf. They worship the calf. Aaron said, eh, maybe we've gone a little bit too far, right? So maybe we better offer a peace offering unto the Lord. And the scripture says they sat down to eat and then they rose up to play. And so we, 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 we set the parallel there that too often we have tried to mix the past with the future. Too often we have, uh, we, we look over our shoulder and we want what we used. They wanted gods like they had back in Egypt. Let's, let's have gods that will go before us like we used to have. And too many times our heart gets stuck in the middle where we're looking over our shoulder and desiring what we used to have. Yet we want this freedom. We want what God's promised, but we're kind of mixed in the middle and we come to church on Sunday. Sundays and offer a few sacrifices and on Monday we wise up to play come on now I'm already preaching y'all I'm just telling y'all what I said last week man wow what a thought process and one last thing that we said last week we we Jesus is having this this conversation in the children of Israel and he's going you know why you don't understand but how can you understand because you're of your father uh, you're, you're of your father the devil and they're they're mad man they're like they're like we are not born out of wedlock we are children of Abraham and and he said well if you were children of Abraham you'd do the works of Abraham but you're of your your father the devil so you do the works of the devil you know why because our heart is a mini me right our heart is a replica of its father wow what a thought process so let's move on this morning and you know i i, I do want to pause and say this i i gave you something to think on last week that all of us no matter who we are if we've had that experience with the Lord Jesus Christ if we've had that salvation experience with the Lord Jesus Christ 
um, we remember that moment. There was something extraordinary that happened at that moment. It is, it is hard for me as a human to put this into words. You know, I, I took a little solace this morning. I took a little comfort this morning because as I was preaching in the first service, I, I, I was reminded that Jesus is, is talking and uh, he's, he's trying to talk to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus is a teacher of the law. I mean, this dude's a, a, a preacher, if you will, in today's language. You understand what I'm saying? He worked in the temple, and, and he had great knowledge of the Scripture. And Jesus is talking to him, and he says, you must be born again. Right? And Nicodemus is looking at him like a calf looking at a new gate. What? What are you saying? Right? He's, Jesus is doing everything he can to explain this salvation experience and, and what must happen and what does happen and man must be born again. And, and Nicodemus cannot wrap his head around it because it's hard for the natural. As a matter of fact, it's impossible for the natural man to understand spiritual things. And so when I'm talking to you and I'm trying to remind you, I'm trying to give you a moment in time. I'm trying to connect what I'm trying, what I'm, what I'm saying to you with what you remember that happened in the past at that moment when you walked down the aisle or wherever you were, when you knelt at that place and you cried out to God, you admitted your sins, you, you threw your hope on Jesus because you came to the realization that you not save yourself, uh, that you, uh, all of your efforts, all of your works were futile, uh, and you came to the place where you cried out, Lord Jesus, save me, like Peter was sinking in the water. He said, save me, because he knew that he was lost without Jesus' help, right? Uh, and that moment that we figured out that we were lost without Jesus, and we called on the name of Jesus, and he saved us, um, it was more than walking down an aisle. It was more than kneeling at an altar. It was more than a few tears. Uh, it was more than a repeated prayer. prayer. Uh, it was more than an emotional moment. Uh, it was more than just an exciting day in our life because we've had plenty of those. Uh, but something extraordinary happened when God reached in our heart, uh, did heart surgery, pulled out the old heart and put in a brand new heart. And that started us on our supernatural journey. His divine power provided His divine nature. Oh, come on now. Woo! His divine power provided His divine nature because He did what no other could do by putting a brand new heart in you and I. Something extraordinary and supernatural that only God can do. And so the, the concept we're talking about is love the Lord thy God with all of your heart. Our heart is a gift from God. He said, I'll take out the old one and I'll put in a new one. So let's Let's start this morning. Number one, I, I want to share with you, and I want to ask the question, how do we treat this gift from God? How do we treat this gift that God has put in us, this new heart that God has put in us? How do we treat that new gift because if it's a gift of, of, from God, uh, yet um, we tend to play with it like it's from Walmart or Dollar Tree. Come on now. Is it a gift from heaven? Yes. But how do we treat 
this gift from heaven. You know, at, at Christmas time, um, it, it's amazing. And, and, and any time, let, let's just say any time, have you ever noticed a little child, they'll make us something, they'll color something, they'll, they'll fold some little figurine, or they'll, they'll do some kind of little putty thing, and, and they walk up to us, uh, and they hand it to us, uh, and what do they do? They automatically look at our face to see if we're pleased with it. Come on, right? When, when it's Christmas time and everybody's opening presents and, and they're tearing into the presents, um, uh, if you're the giver of the gift, you're not looking to see what is in the package. Oh, come on now. Everybody else might be looking to see what's in the package, uh, but you're not looking at the package. Uh, you're looking at their face to see, uh, do they like, uh, do they appreciate, uh, do they value what I gave them? Right? What an amazing thought process. And how many times uh, have we given gifts? How many times uh, have we given presents? Um, and uh, they, the, the child has opened the gift um, and it's uh, a shirt or a pair of pants. Uh, and they look at and their countenance on their face sinks uh, and they throw it aside and move to the next present because what they wanted uh, was not what they needed. Uh, what they wanted was a toy that they could play with. Oh my goodness. Do we value the gift that he gave us? Mm. We often take our hearts places and expose our hearts to things that we should not take it or expose it to you know we think I, I've often used the example of getting a new car and man when you get a new car uh, you know don't bring that that food in my car don't open that pop in my car right don't drink that coffee in my car and and when we get a new car we park out on the back 40 because uh, we spaz out over every little uh, scratch and over every little did we hand wash it uh, uh, you know for for a while and then the new wears off on the car and we just driving it through the self wash you know what i'm saying we we uh, with our coffee cup in hand Come on now. When the new, where see, when when we first get saved, man, we're excited. Man, have you ever? You know what I'm talking about? When you, if you'll remember back when you were first saved, if you'll remember back when you first got your new heart. I made a I made a joke last week, man. I uh, when I came down to the altar, uh, I, I was I was angry. I was mad. I, I I hated everybody and everything, and and life stunk. And and uh, you know, I had a I had a uh, a, a terminally sick child and and uh, I, I was unsatisfied with myself I was unsatisfied with life as a whole uh, and uh, and I came down and and, and man uh, let's just fight at the drop of a hat because I was just angry with everybody and I walked down the aisle and when I knelt and I accepted Christ uh, and I got the heart transplant uh, I, I made a joke that when I got up I even loved broccoli and spinach right I loved everybody because I had a heart change. But for a while, we treat it great. We don't dare take that brand new car off road, right? But then the new wears off and eventually we start watching the things that we used to watch and listening to the things that we used to listen to and going to places we used to go and we start to letting our guard down and we start to exposing it back to uh, uh, and treating our new heart like we used to treat our old heart. Oh, man. There's a reason that the Bible says don't commit adultery. Let 
let's take it a little deeper James also says as we referred to last week he says to those that those believers that are in love with the world he calls them adulterers and adulteresses that are in love with the world what is the what well, why is it is it not good to commit adultery and why what is he talking about because adultery infers um, that we are piecing out something uh, that was wholly meant for one oh mm, come on listen all, all of you single folk in the house all a single no anyway uh, all of you single folk in the house whether you're a young person all of you young people listen to me uh, see the, the usually the dream is uh, you know I want to grow up and I want to meet Prince Charming I want to meet uh, 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 the beautiful woman of, of my dreams I want to I want to get married and, and start a family and live happily ever after uh, um, like they pretend to do in Hollywood and nobody does and uh, and so uh, we 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 have that hope and that dream. Uh, then and yet the the scripture talks to us about fornication. Uh, and and so here's what's happening uh, is that with fornication uh, you're you're not yet there. And uh, here you are. You're doing damage. Uh, you're playing uh, with the heart. Uh, that uh, you're doing damage to potential. You're doing damage to f- that future relationship because you're playing with that thing that God meant only for one how oh it's no big deal we're just going on a few dates he's playing around a little bit Come on now. I, y'all still love me, right? It's okay to be real, right? Because our culture's like, what's the big deal? It's just sex. What's love got to do? Come on now. How are we treating that gift? of heaven that God put in us. Number two, how should we treat this gift from heaven? Hey, Lance, would you come here for a second, please? I, 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 uh, I just need his help for just a minute. I, Proverbs chapter four, stay right here. Proverbs chapter four says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it will flow the springs of life. Another translation, the NIV says it this way, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Uh, The scripture there says keep or guard. And that means to protect, to take care of. Now, there, there's a, a guy, his name is Tim Couch. Back in 1998, Tim Couch was, uh, he played for Kentucky, and he was, uh, he was the SEC uh, quarterback. I mean, he he was the man. He was voted uh, uh, the the SEC the 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 man of the year. That means he was the the number one football player at his position in all of college football. He was the man. And so this guy was six four, two hundred and twenty two pounds, and. He was a stud. 
everybody was just ranting and raving over Tim Couch. And, and uh, in 1999, when the, uh, when the draft happened, he was drafted number one draft choice uh, of uh, uh, the Cleveland Browns. Now, they were just uh, uh, coming out... Uh, 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 the expansion teams. They were just reactivated as one of the expansion teams. And this team, they wanted to to make a statement. They wanted to build a football team. And so out of all of the players in all of the draft, they drafted this guy first because they wanted a stud. They wanted somebody that they could build their organization on. And uh, uh, so we see he played for the Cleveland Browns about five years and uh, he, he uh, uh, you know, he completed over a thousand passes and, and uh, uh, you know, it was like a, a 11,000 plus yards that this guy, uh, that this guy had and, and uh, he threw 64 touchdowns and, and uh, Uh, But here's the deal. (laughs) He threw 64 touchdowns, but he threw 67 interceptions. In five years of football with the Cleveland Browns, homeboy fumbled the ball 34 times considered one of the biggest busts in football history after five years they traded him to Green Bay about three years later he went over to the to the Jags and then before we know it He's just a member of the backup squad. And nobody remembers Tim Couch. (laughs) I think he's finally getting it. Because you can have all the right stuff. Oh, come on. You can have all the right stuff. You can be skilled. You can be good looking. You can, uh, you can have a college education, money in the bank. You can have all of that stuff. You can, you can be fast. You can be agile. But the number one rule of football is protect the ball. Nobody cares if you cross the goal line without the ball. <laughs> And the number one rule of life is to protect the heart. See, you can be super mom. You can be soccer mom of the year. PTA president. Keep a spotless house. Be a gourmet cook. Be good in bed. Be pretty. And fail at the number one rule of life and still be messed up. You can be dad of the year coach of all of the little leagues around you, right? Not just your son, but everybody else's too, right? Dad of the year. Super husband. Super provider. You fail at the number one rule of life is to protect your heart and steal fall short. Thank you, Lance. I appreciate it. Did y'all give it up for Lance? The enemy wants to steal 
your heart. The enemy wants to poison our hearts. Again, he says, guard your heart. It's our responsibility to guard our hearts. Let's see. It says, with all diligence. With all diligence. I was instructed today. See, I, a running back is instructed. You know, he can be a great running back. But if he carries the ball wrong, he's going to lose the ball. When I played football, everybody played fair, and they were just out to tackle you, right? Today, they're punching the ball out. They're grabbing the ball, stripping the ball. That's the way they're coached. That's the way they're trained. Because the most important thing is not the runner, it's the ball. The most important thing is not the package on the outside, it's what's in here. Oh, wait. And there's a few tweaks that you can make. Carry the ball on the outside. Fingertips, palm forearm, bicep, chest and then cover it with a second arm please guard the ball you didn't have a 25 yard gain and fumble the ball and it's negated guard your heart when it comes to temptation guard your heart when offenses come guard your heart when sloth comes Guard your heart. Listen, don't take on somebody else's offense. <clears throat> Is there anybody in the house this morning? Don't take on somebody else's offense. Guard your heart. How should we treat our heart? How valuable, number three, how valuable is the heart of man? Again, Proverbs chapter four says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from what? From it, from your heart. Everything we do, the heart is the center of everything in our life. Every attitude flows out of the heart. Every motive flows out. Every It affects or infects, either way, it affects everything in our life. Above all, protect your heart. Listen, the condition of our heart affects everything else we do. So the heart, listen, when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, the first thing he names is what? The heart, the heart of man. The heart is the most influential of all of the four that Jesus names. The heart is the most influential piece. Has greater influence than everything else. B under that is the heart is the most powerful thing. When the heart wants something, come on now. When the heart desires something or loves something, the great prophetess Aretha Franklin <laughs> says there ain't no mountain high enough and there ain't no valley low enough to keep me from getting to you, babe. Right? When the heart wants something, it's got the greatest influence it, listen, my heart will outweigh my, my will. My heart will outweigh what my mind knows is right. My heart has power and influence. Every time. In my life, as I look back over my life, that I stepped outside of his grace. It was because I failed at protecting my heart. 
Man, I was in my office on Monday this, this past week and I began to weep and cry out to God. And I, I was just thinking of, of all of the times that I failed, all of the times that I've, that I've let God down. And I was just thanking God for His mercy and His, His grace. Just, just, God, you got me through. God, you forgave me. You, you just, your, your grace is amazing. But in every time that I can see that, that I, I made those mistakes, that, I, that I, I, I made bad choices, that I did things I shouldn't do, the things that I regret the things that I'm ashamed of. I can attribute every one of those times I didn't protect my heart. I opened the door for the enemy to attack. I'm astonished by His grace and mercy. I I'm going to read just for a second as I try to close. I'm going to read out of Ezekiel or commentary on Ezekiel 36. It says, God here promises that He will work a good work in them to qualify them. God, listen, God will work a good work to qualify them. Who will? God will work a good work to qualify them for the good work He intended to bring about for them. That God would cleanse them from the pollution of sin. Who cleanses? God does. Take away the sin, the sense of guilt and thereby purifying us from all corrupt inclinations and dispositions. Christ's blood was cleansing to us, and it is a Holy Spirit that makes us holy. <clears throat> wow. Ezekiel 36 says, From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. I will save you from all of your uncleanliness. Wow. Sin is repulsive to God. When guilt is pardoned and the corrupt nature sanctified, then we are cleansed from our filthiness. And there is no other way of being saved from it. We cannot sanctify God's name unless He sanctifies our hearts, nor live to His glory, but by His grace, that God would give them a new heart and a disposition of mind excellent in itself and vastly different from what it was before. Thank God. God will work an inward change, a new heart, and a new spirit. And these are necessary for walking in newness of life. This is that divine nature which believers are by the promises made partakers of. Wow! How often do we as believers, how often do we let down our guard? Do we treat our hearts as invaluable, unvaluable? How often do we expose our hearts to things that we shouldn't? Play with our hearts in ways that we shouldn't? Above all, you find yourself angry right now? Did you protect your heart? You find yourself in an unforgiveness situation or bitter situation? Did you fail to protect your heart? Do you find yourself less than in love with your mate? Did you fail to protect your heart? 
Do you find yourself teetering on the brink of making that wrong decision? Falling for that temptation because you failed to protect your heart, to keep your heart, to guard the football. See, for some of you listening to the sound of my voice, it may be a death situation. Maybe you don't know Christ or maybe you've backslidden. Maybe you've turned your back and walked away. Or maybe we're just talking about infection in the heart. You ever had an infection before? Maybe a tooth. You didn't even know there was a problem till it started hurting. Maybe an ingrown hair. Maybe a surgery. Maybe a cut. What happens? That infection. All of a sudden you start feeling some pain. It's not normal. You start noticing some redness. Some swelling. Fever. You got some nasty stuff in there. Because it's infection. Often, we have allowed some things that were not right, were not good for us. And we're not talking about death, but we are talking about infection. And you know what? Infection left untreated will lead to either amputation or death. Come on now. He said, above everything else, guard your heart. For out of your heart flows everything else in life. And we parted our heart out uh, uh, over time to things we shouldn't have parted our heart out to. Or we've exposed our heart. Or we, we haven't protected our heart. We haven't made sure on a daily, no, this can't stay. No, this isn't right. No, this isn't good. No, I'm not going to allow that feeling or that emotion or that offense or that anger or that temptation. I'm not going to allow that. Because he says above everything else in life, the number one rule of life is protect your heart. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart. The basic rule is I have to guard my heart if I'm going to love Him with all of it. Would you stand to your feet this morning? This morning, every head bowed, every eye closed in the house. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I, listen, I've been challenged this morning to re-examine my heart, reconsider some things, to Allow the Holy Spirit to 
put his finger on some things. I, I really need to reconsider the way that I'm protecting my heart. I've been challenged by the Holy Spirit this morning. If that's you, just all over the house, would you just, it's going to take a man or a woman of God to say, you know what, I've been challenged by the Holy Spirit this morning. Would you just slip your hand up and say, I've been challenged. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. God bless you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, be honest. Thank you. Yes. I've been challenged by the Holy Spirit. Do a better job at protecting my heart, not taking lightly the value of this heart that God's put in me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in the house this morning and you would say, Pastor, either I don't have a relationship with Christ, or you know what? I I I had a relationship with Him, but Right now, I just, it's me that walked away. It's me that needs to come back home. And I need to make things right with God. If that's you this morning, you're in the house with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just slip your hand up and right back down? Thank you. Is there another? Thank you. God bless you, man. There's someone else this morning. Just slip your hand up right back down quickly this morning quickly this morning. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Is there another in the house this morning? God wants to do something extraordinary in you. Anyone else today? Listen, would you look at me for just a second all over the house? Could we just spend a few moments in these altars today? Just come and just say, God, if it's that valuable, if it's that important, here's my heart. Where can I protect it better? Where do I need to make some changes? Show me. Show me. Because wrong exposure exposes us, right? The enemy wants to steal our heart. He wants to poison our heart. And he's doing everything he can to get the ball, guys. I promise you, he's setting you up. But with God's help, with God's help, we can protect, guard, and keep this heart that God's put.